Yanan Wang, welcome to the podcast. Hi. Hi. How are you today? I'm good. Good. Uh, so I came across um, your account on Twitter, which I found very, very exciting. You are known as the Fossil Locator on Twitter. Um, <laughs> so explain something to me. What exactly are you? Are you a geologist, a paleontologist? What it, What is it exactly that we should call you? Um, I consider myself to be a geologist since I sort of a, I'm sort of a jack of all trades in all fields in geology so i deal with fossils minerals meteorites so i basically have a lot of knowledge in a lot of geology areas yeah and that's that's pr pretty much why i'm asking is because you, you know so much about actually a lot of things uh so you're based out of new york uh actually i'm based out of the washington dc region oh okay Washington, D.C. So how did you, um, essentially, how did you become interested in uh, the topic of geology or fossils, minerals, and all that stuff? What, it, what was the, the thing that, that really, you know, got you interested in this topic? Uh, let's see. I first, uh, I think I found my first fossil when I was a kid around like the age of seven. I was like playing in a creek and I found a, what turned out to be a crinoid stem. And so ever since then, I've been hooked on rocks and fossils, and I've been collecting them ever since. And then I went to college at Princeton, majored in geosciences. And then after that, I've been working on various projects related to geology. And uh, that's how we got to where we are now. And where we are now, which is what? Uh, sort of a, well, geologist and uh writer of kids' books about geology related topics. <laughs> yeah, so one of the books that uh, you, you've written called 50 State Fossils, a guidebook for aspiring paleontologists. That's a book that we're actually going to be giving away uh, with this, this podcast episode. So tell me a little bit about that book real quick. Oh, so basically uh, about 43 of the U.S. states have official state fossils or state dinosaurs or other th state symbols that are related to fossils. So uh, at some point, I realized there wasn't a book about this, aside from like an adult book, but there wasn't a kid's book about this. I was like, huh, maybe I should just go and write it. So I went ahead and I pitched the idea to Schiffer Publishing, and they liked it. And uh, yeah, I went ahead and wrote it. And my friend Jane Levy uh, illustrated it. And then uh, two years later, we have this book out. Amazing. Now, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quiz you on that then. Um, what's, uh, what's the state fossil for uh, the state of New York? State of New York, it's the Eurypterid. It's uh, essentially a sea scorpion. And technically, it's Eurypterus remipes, which is a very common Eurypterid found throughout uh, several deposits in New York. Okay. How about Alaska? Uh, that would be the woolly mammoth. Because uh, they find a lot of woolly mammoths up there because they're trapped in permafrost. And they usually find them while they're gold mining because they're washing out the dirt using water. And all these tr tusks and teeth and bone parts get washed out. Amazing. What about uh, Texas? Uh, let's see. Texas has a state dinosaur. I believe it's... Oh, hold on. Let me... I need to think of the scientific name for it. Oh, yeah. Okay, it's the Paluxysaurus. And uh, what's interesting about this, it's a very long-necked dinosaur. And originally it was uh, Plurocellus, which was another dinosaur. And then they re-identified it, and then the state changed the name to Paluxysaurus. And technically, they in like 2012, they found out that Paluxysaurus is actually another dinosaur called Sauroposeidon, but they haven't changed the name yet. <laughs> Okay, so what does it mean then, like a state fossil? Does that mean that if you happen to be in Alaska, you find, I don't know, a mammoth tusk somewhere? Uh, you can't keep it, can you? Uh, fossil laws vary throughout. Um, well, basically, fossil laws, it depends on whose property you find it on. So, like, just because it's a state fossil, it doesn't mean the state owns it. It's just a, a designation to celebrate an item or promote tourism. So say you're um, you're just out there walking around in Alaska and you find a woolly mammoth tusk. If you own the land, technically you own the fossil. If you're on a friend's land and you have 
permission, you could probably collect the fossil and your friend technically owns it, but he could give it to you. If you're on state land or federal land, then it's uh, state land's going to vary. Federal land, it's illegal to collect vertebrate fossils from. And so it's there's a whole variety of jurisdictional issues. So if a listener is interested in going fossil collecting, they should look up the local laws or best to just get permission from a landowner. That's really good information to share because it's it's one of the things that myself, you know, I've been very interested in this kind of stuff. And I've been like, wait a minute, can I even pick up these cool rocks or these cool kind of, I, I you know, I've, I've seen some <laughs> fossils around and I'm like, I don't even know whose jurisdiction this is, you know? So it gets really, um, it can be really difficult, can it? Oh, yeah. It's like, especially in the U.S., there's like various laws, like, for example, on like some federal land, uh, some like a Bureau of Land Management land, Bureau of Land Management land. Uh, you're allowed to collect common foss- common invertebrate fossils, low, so like fossil leaves or fossil shells and stuff like that. But you're not allowed to collect vertebrate fossils, so no dinosaur bones. And then it's also, you're only allowed to collect it for personal use. So you're not allowed to sell it or trade it. So it's uh, it varies. Wow. It really gets really wrapped up into like bureaucratic stuff, but it makes sense, right? I guess the laws mm-hmm. are there to, to protect... Um, I yep. don't know, historic, historic stuff. Yeah. And it also changes, like, if you're on, say, a national park or national monument, it's completely illegal to collect anything. So, yeah. Okay. But also, hmm. it's like, if, if someone's listening to this in the far future, make sure you check the information first before you think about collecting anything, because, like, the laws are changing every few years. So, Yeah. <laughs> Okay, that's good to know. Uh, so fossils, I mean, it, mm-hmm. all of us think of Jurassic Park, right? We think about the the stuff that's stuck in amber that mm-hmm. was big in, in that film. Um, how realistic is it that we would find things stuck in amber? Is that a common finding? Oh, yes. Uh, things in amber are very common. And that's one of the research areas I work with because like, uh, one of my like side gigs is I work in a lot of jewelry related things. So I go through a lot of fossil amber and I pick out interesting insects. And if I see an insect that that is potentially new, I usually reach out to a researcher in that area and we collaborate on a paper for a minute. So insects in amber is very common. And we have even have like uh, things like dinosaur feathers in amber and stuff like that. So it's... Uh, yeah, stuff in amber is uh, very real. <laughs> Unless, of course, it's a fake piece of amber. That's a different topic. Yeah, we're, I actually want to make a note of that. We'll get to that a little, mm-hmm. little bit later. Because one of the things I don't understand is what exactly is amber and where do you find it? Amber is fossil resin. So what happens is, like, you know, from uh, trees, like pine trees and other trees, you have resin that comes out when the tree is damaged. And that resin, once it gets buried and heated, it changes its uh, molecular content to become essentially more plasticized. And so it becomes a slightly harder substance called amber. And amber, it's uh, basically fossilized tree resin, and it's also very light. So it's light enough where a chunk of amber will float in salt water. So this is why oftentimes people are like, oh, this is plastic, but no, it's actually amber. But then again, there's also a lot of fake amber in the form of plastic. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, why don't we talk about the fake amber right mm-hmm. now then? So how um, how can you tell the difference between the two? Uh, let's see. Amber and versus fake amber. Uh, first off, if you see a really perfect thing in amber, like a huge scorpion, a huge butterfly, a huge anything, it's fake. Amber inclusions tend to be fairly small, like under probably two centimeters. And uh, this is because like larger critters usually get out of amber fairly easily. So like large inclusions in amber are rare. And so if you see something like a large scorpion in amber and it's for sale for like $20, it's fake. (laughs) And the other thing is like um, other ways you could test amber. First of all, make sure like see if the amber floats. Amber should be very light. So if someone's using a heavy thing like glass, it's not amber. Also, amber 
if you like, sometimes if you rub it, you could get like a slightly resiny scent off of it. But sometimes f fake versions also do that. And um, yeah, it's there's it's actually fairly difficult to tell the real stuff from the fake stuff. Just once you have enough examples of the real stuff, you'll start recognizing that it has a certain texture, a certain feel, a certain look to it. But uh, offhand, it's more difficult to tell. But if something's too good to be true, it probably is. Okay, so all the stuff that you find at museum gift stores is not a real scorpion in amber then? Uh, some. Depends on the museum. It's like a lot of museums do have bunches of real amber, but they're like fairly expensive and they're small. It's like the piece of amber will usually be under like five centimeters and the inclusions will definitely be under like one centimeter. If there's anything bigger than that, it's like, it's highly suspect. Okay, that's good to know. Uh, so if I'm walking through, let's say, a, um, a forest in northern Ontario, I don't know how mm -hmm. much you know Canada, but let's say I'm walking through a forest in northern Ontario, can I f easily find amber fossils or is that something that's more found in water? Uh, no, amber is found in certain deposits, usually places that are that used to be swampy or very vegetated like 30, 20, 30 million years or more ago. So if you're walking through a modern forest, chances are it's just a modern forest. You're not going to find amber. But there are a few places in Canada, I forgot exactly where, where there were Cretaceous amber found. So basically, you're going to have to look for where you want to be is you want to be somewhere where the geology is real old, sometime between like the Cretaceous and Eocene. So sometime between like, say, 100 million years and 20 million years ago. And so you want to make sure the rocks are like that. You want to make sure it's sedimentary. And then if you start finding a lot of plant fossils, then you might be able to find amber. Oh, that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. So... One of the things I want to do, so I'm th I'm thinking of moving to the East Coast with my partner, and one of the mm -hmm. things I want to do is um just start digging random holes here and there <laughs> in, in the property that we're gonna we're gonna eventually mm -hmm. purchase. Uh, what can you find if you were to dig, let's say, a three foot, you know, deep hole? Is there anything you could find interesting in the random hole? Uh, yeah, uh, it all depends on where you are, like uh. Up in Canada, you have a lot of like glacial deposits from like the ice caps that used to be there. There used to be glaciers and they moved a lot of rocks around. So digging a random hole up there, you could find, say, garnets or little crystals or rocks from hundreds of miles away or uh, even uh, potentially diamonds. But uh, yeah. <laughs> diamonds in Canada? Oh, yeah. Canada is uh, one of the largest diamond miners in the uh, Western Hemisphere. Uh, it's an interesting story. It's like, uh, I be as I recall, decades ago, there were researchers who were finding diamonds throughout the middle United States in places like Wisconsin, Minnesota, uh, the Dakotas. They find like these diamonds in like glacial deposits. So someone eventually traced all the minerals all the way to northern Canada, like I believe uh, uh, Northwest Territories. And they eventually traced it until they discovered a diamond pipe up in the uh, way up there in the Arctic Circle. And they started mining diamonds. And so now Canadian diamonds are like, uh, you know, Canada is one of the larger producers of diamonds in the uh, Western Hemisphere. And the uh, they're also a pretty, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A pretty... Um, ethically sourced compared to other diamond locations because it's a modern country and so they have more strict regulations for mining and for labor so if someone wanted to get a uh, diamond with better ethical sourcing there are canadian diamonds for sale at a premium so i guess that leads me to my next question mm -hmm. i mean back in the day there was a, you know a gold rush mm -hmm. um is it possible for someone, let's say a Canadian, I, I would assume, a Canadian mm -hmm. citizen to go up to where the diamond locations are really found, go into like crown land or, or land that's not really owned by anyone and, you know, dig for diamonds themselves? Uh, probably not because all, literally all the diamond pipes have been staked and are now like uh, have claims on them. So. <laughs> okay, so it's too late. At this point, it's way too late. I mean, if you're randomly in like a glacial till or like a glacier deposit, you probably could pan it for like diamonds or gold. 
depending on what Canadian prospecting laws are. But uh, yeah, your odds of finding something are like really like a million to one. But there is a chance because like, um, well, okay. One of the ways that diamonds were found in Wisconsin was one of the researchers, he would go to car washes and set up a special mat to help catch like dust coming off the cars. And from that dust, he was actually able to like collect diamonds from it. So, <laughs> wait, what? That sounds amazing. What was this? Uh, do you remember his name? I do not. Uh, but okay, there was, I'll have to Google it. There. But yeah, I'll send you a link to the book once I figure out which which book it was. But uh, yeah, that's one of the methods because I believe diamonds stick to like oily surfaces. So he created like a special oiled mat to like catch diamonds, and so like cars would people would wash their cars and. The dirt would wash over the mat and he would find a few diamonds every now and then. So it is possible. <laughs> now, now I'm really curious to know if he got to keep them. Uh, Yeah, because he was in the U.S. So this was like a finder's keepers thing. And he had an arrangement with the car wash. <laughs> so have you ever been out prospecting? Uh, Yeah, uh, out in the Western U.S., like Colorado, I've tried my hand at like gold panning and stuff like that. Uh, did not find anything. <laughs> Out in Nevada, there's a few sites where you could like hunt for um, opal, and I did get some good opal specimens from Nevada. And so opal, tell me a little bit about opal, because that's a very popular, mm. uh, I guess, is it called a mineral? Is it a rock? What is it exactly? Uh, opal is a, gem, let me see, hold on, I need to remember if opal is uh, officially a gem or... Opal is a gemstone. It's a hydrated form of silica. And uh, hold on one second. And yeah, silica yeah. for our listeners is just a, pretty much another word for glass. Uh, yeah, silica you know, is right. glass, quartz, uh, basically silica. Uh, yeah, silica is SiO2. It's a well, yeah, compound. But uh, yeah, okay, so opal is a mineral. And uh, so there's various forms of opal. There's like precious opal. There's like fire opal. There's like boring opals. But uh, it's a form of silica with a lot of water in it. And the water forms essentially tiny lenses that like give opal like this dazzling color to it. Yeah, I highly recommend that people Google that because opals are just beautiful. They're, they're really different uh, varieties of them. Yeah. Uh, have all of the minerals been identified? Like, is it possible to to stumble upon a new one? Oh, no, uh, yes, yes. Uh, like, uh, every year there's about 60 to 100 new minerals that are discovered and named. So currently there are up to like 6,000 some minerals, I believe. But uh, yeah, so someone will find a new mineral in a rock deposit somewhere because... In order to be an official mineral, it has to be like naturally formed in a geologic process. So you can't like create it at home. And anything that's like man made or accidentally man made does not count as a mineral. So uh, there are people who go out there and they look for rocks and they uh, find new minerals. And then they uh, do a study on the mineral and publish on it. And then uh, the people at the, I believe, International Mineralogical Association then vote on it and decide if it gets listed as a new mineral. And this happens quite frequently every year. I've seen a lot of your your tweets and you frequently post pictures of minerals and stuff like that. Um, is that something that you actively do? Do you go out hunting for minerals sometimes? Uh, not within the past few years, but I used to go hunting for some minerals. And eventually it just became easier for me to just like buy and sell minerals and like find the ones I'm looking for. Usually yeah. like a, a lot of stuff in auctions in estate sales where like someone passes away and then their mineral collection comes up for sale. And it's like, I know specifically what I'm looking for. And yeah. <laughs> what do you do with them? Uh, a lot of minerals I sell and some of that I collect. Okay. And what's your favorite one? Oh, uh, rhodochrosite. Uh, Rhodochrosite is a, I believe, manganese mineral, and it's got a really brilliant red color. And uh, basically, think of a, a Jolly Rancher candy of the red version. It's 
like that, but in crystal form. So it's a beautiful gemstone. And it's found in a few places on Earth, but one of the best places is Colorado at a mine called the Sweet Home Mine, which has produced some of the best specimens in the world. And they're very rare and highly desired. <laughs> very cool. So finding minerals, I tend to pick up rocks that are just shiny. They mm -hmm. just, there's something that's different. Um, I found a rock the other day. It, it was uh, reflecting like, a, it was very, very black and it was reflecting a rainbow. And I posted mm. it to Twitter and somebody said, oh, that looks like obsidian. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you know when you're a beginner, like, how do you know if you've got something that's actually really interesting? That's a good question. Um, I would say, um, actually, if you're a beginner, it's all interesting and that's great because <laughs> that's how you learn. So you start collecting some rocks, you find it, figure out which ones are rare, which ones are not rare, and you just start identifying them with help online and otherwise. And eventually, um, yeah, you learn more and then eventually you'll figure out what's rarer and what's not as rare. Now, I, like I said, I mean, I've just been picking stuff up in areas mm -hmm. that I know aren't owned by anybody, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so how do you, how do you, what do you recommend in terms of people who might want to find quartz or you know fool's gold mm. or stuff like that like what are the actual techniques that people do to when they have something specific in mind and they want to go hunting for it Ah, uh, let's see well okay if you're looking for say crystals or really pretty and shiny rocks then you want to play be somewhere with like igneous deposits so somewhere there used to be volcanic activities or lots of granite and stuff like that that's where you're going to get more crystals if you're looking for fossils, you want to be somewhere sedimentary, where there used to be like an ocean and that put down layers of sediment. And so it depends on uh, basically what's underneath the ground. And there is actually an app for that. It's called Rock D. And it's basically a map thing that shows you what the deposits are where you are right now. And then you could click on it. It could tell you what's found there, what sort of fossils are there, what sort of minerals might be there. and it's very useful. Sorry, what's the name of the app? Uh, rock uh, apostrophe D. Oh, rocked. Okay, yeah. gotcha. Yeah, definitely check that out because, yeah, it'll show you what's around. <laughs> so that'll also help you find fossils? Yes. Okay, so really, like you said, it's really just examining what kind of location you're looking mm -hmm. at in terms of what was there in the past. Yes. Is there such a thing as um, like modern? modern fossils or modern uh, minerals? Yeah, I mean, minerals are formed all the time. So it's like, uh, there's like lakes, salt lakes everywhere where like halite naturally being formed. So minerals are forming all the time. Uh, fossils have to be 11,700 years old to be a fossil officially because of like all these like technical definitions basically it has to be at least uh, pleistocene in age and that ends at 11,700 years ago but uh, various things like petrification where like say an uh, of say a lobster is being replaced by minerals and ter being turned into what will eventually be a fossil that's occurring all the time so there are quote new fossils okay but officially it has to be 11,700 years old how do mm -hmm. how are fossils aged like how is that evaluated uh let's see there's a lot of different dating things uh first uh there's like carbon dating but that only works for about forty thousand years so if you have something say like a mammoth bone you could probably carbon date that uh past that there's other minerals that can be used for dating like uh zircons and a lot of dating is based on stratigraphy where it's like this is this layer, and this is this layer, and here's a uh, igneous layer. And based on the minerals in that igneous layer, we know this igneous layer is 300 million years old. That means any layer below that is going to be older than 300 million years. So you sort of date things based on where they are above and below things. So let's say I were to find a fossil that mm -hmm. looks very, very interesting. Uh, who do I bring it to? Uh local museums or college paleontologists <laughs> okay yeah and, okay so yeah that's that, uh, usually are... the best thing it's like uh 
a lot of museums and at least like Twitter paleontologists, like they'll usually be happy to take a look at things and like give you a quick identification as long as like, so, uh, yeah, they're usually pretty happy to do that. And occasionally they'll encourage people to donate their specimens if it's interesting enough to a museum and stuff like that. Okay. Now you've told me about your favorite mineral. What about mm -hmm. your favorite fossil? Favorite fossil? That is a, that's a good question. Uh, about 350 to 400 million years ago, there were these critters called trigonal tarbids. And they basically looked like spiders. And they were heavily, essentially heavily armored spiders. And they only existed during that time period. And their fossils are fairly rare, but they're very, very cool looking. <laughs> So you have one of those? Uh, yeah, I actually discover, helped discover one in a formation in New Mexico and wrote a paper on it with some researchers. Yeah. Do you get just super excited every time you look at stuff that you find or stuff that you buy? Oh, yeah. It's like, I love it. <laughs> so are you like, you know, pretty much living out, uh, you know, your kind of childhood dream now? Uh, yeah, I'm sort of like... I get to play with rocks and uh, get to do fun things. <laughs> it is it is super fun. I mean, like I said, you know, before we started recording is mm -hmm. that as a kid, you know, it's, it's the one thing you, you, when you're watching, uh, you know, Raiders in the Lost Ark and and uh, Jurassic Park and all these cool movies in the 80s, 90s. And you just think well, like, wow, man, all these these old thing, old things exist in the world. They're just waiting to be discovered. Mm hmm. So oh, yeah. are there any modern treasure hunters these days? Oh, yes. Uh, treasure hunting both in, say, it exists in, I guess, minerals, fossils, meteorites, and archaeology. Uh, I'm not going to talk much, much about the archaeology side because, like, I'm sure there's archaeologists who can talk about it better. And to the archaeology community, like, treasure hunting is very taboo because they don't like it because they're trying to it's people trying to profit off of history. So that's one thing. In the fossil world, there are a lot of commercial fossil dealers where they'll dig up fossils and sell it for profit. And so this there's a there's a lot of conflict in the paleontological world about this because some paleontologists are all right with this because the fossil hunters they're also digging up and finding new things and often they'll either donate a specimen to a museum or sell it to the museum at cost. So that's good. But sometimes you have other people who are just in it purely for profit and they'll want to sell a dinosaur for millions of dollars. And paleontologists are angry about that because then they don't get it for their museum and they feel that the specimen is like lost to research. In the mineral world, there's uh, basically like mineral miners and hunters everywhere. So that's a very thriving treasure hunting community. And like lots of people out there digging for gold and quartz and uh, rhodochrosite and stuff like that. And then there's meteorites where you have like meteorite hunters out there. Every time a meteorite, uh, every time there's a big meteorite fall, there's meteorite hunters who go out and track down where these meteorites fell. And then they collect them or they buy them from locos and then resell it for a profit. So there's treasure hunting of all forms still going on. How did they track meteorites? Oh, this is fun. It's like, um, okay, so you see a meteorite and say someone has a video of it. And based on where they took the me a video from, and they could figure out which direction the meteorite was traveling. And then they could triangulate that with other witness sightings and then triangulate it on a map and figure out the trajectory. And they can also, uh, sometimes if it's a larger meteorite, it actually will, the dust plume from the meteorite will actually show up on weather radar. So it'll show up for about like one or two frames, but that's enough for someone to figure out, oh, it was going through this altitude in this direction, probably at this speed, and then they could figure out where the meteorite might have fell, might have fallen. Yeah. It's funny because in my head, I'm imagining like modern day treasure hunters who are like have a Google Alerts set for, I saw this cool meteorite today or something, you know, where they just yeah, kind of go that on actually, YouTube. That exists. There's like actually several systems set up where like, uh, uh, there's actually, I forgot who set it up, but someone has a, 
thing set up where like a person reports if they saw a meteor or something like that. If enough people report, like voila, they instantly have the system that triggers and it's like, oh, there's a new meteor fall. I, I don't know if you know the answer to this, but how often do do meteors fall? Uh, let's see. Uh, probably ever like technically constantly, <laughs> but uh, in terms of like um. Uh, a good size meteorite where like you have a few kilos of it worth collecting uh probably once uh i don't know okay let's say a big fall where it's worth it for people to go out there and travel out there to like go hunt it down something that size happens about once a month that's actually a lot more often than i thought i thought you were going to say once a year or once every 5 years but once a month that's that's a lot yeah <laughs> Wow. And so are they, are these, uh, would you say these are commonly once a month in the United States or once a month around, around, uh, the around the world? world? In the United okay. States, it's probably once every six months, once every year. But still, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. So th does that mean that there are a lot of meteorites on the market? Oh, yeah. There are a lot of meteorites on the market. It's like, um, first you have your classic, like, uh, American meteorites, of which there are like, hundreds of different names in some places like uh for example uh texas has a lot of meteorites and some of the meteorite fall fields cover several square miles so so they found like hundreds of meteorites within a few square miles so in the u.s there's a lot of meteorites but where there's even more meteorites is northwest africa so like morocco and the sahara desert area because meteorites get preserved very well out there because meteorites like they like low humidity high humidity will turn it to dust but they like uh the sahara desert has low humidity and if you're going through the sahara and you see a meteor a rock just sitting there it's like why is there a rock here and then people will pick it up and bring it to someone who will identify it as a meteor meteorite <laughs> what are what are they uh, mostly composed of about i believe 80 some percent of meteorites are what's called chondrites. Chondrites are little chondrules, or basically little spheres that have cemented together in space to form asteroids. So think of it like uh, 4 billion years ago, there was a lot of dust around in the solar system. And when this dust and particles come together via gravity, it forms an asteroid. And these are the majority of meteorites. And then you have 15%, which are like iron meteorites, which are like the cores of larger planet toys or asteroids. So you have something, say, a few hundred miles across. The center of that is going to be hot enough to form like liquid iron and stuff like that. So the iron meteorites are the cores of these larger asteroids that got destroyed at some point in time. And so we get those meteorites as well. And then you have a few rarer meteorite types like meteorites from the moon and meteorites from Mars. Now, these happen when, uh, say, the moon or Mars gets hit by a large meteor impact. That impact will send chunks of the moon into outer space, and the moon will drift down to Earth as meteorites. You've just kind of blown my mind, and now I want a meteorite. So <laughs> I have to ask you now, because you're the expert, mm -hmm. where could, could I get a meteorite, and how can I tell it's real? Uh, that's a good question. Um, let's see. There's a lot of meteorites on eBay, and uh, there's a, I don't know if you have like little rock and mineral shops up where you are, but there's probably there's probably going to be meteorites in rock and mineral shops. So meteorites are fairly common, and they could vary from like something that just costs like fifteen dollars to something that costs thousands of dollars. So finding getting a meteorite from a shop or from online is fairly easy. Uh, now, as for whether or not it's real. Um, well, one, uh, if it's too cheap, it's once again, it's like it's suspicious. And two, there's uh, various organizations like the, I believe, IMCC, which is an international meteorite association. And uh, its members are s supposed to be uh, very honest. And if someone says they're a member of that and they have a membership number and they're selling meteorites, they're probably legit. It's very rare for someone to be part of certain associations to sell fake meteorites. But as for how the average person can tell if a rock, for example, if you found a rock and it looks like a meteorite, chances are it's not a meteorite. 
I've like I've had hundreds of people show me rocks they found that they think are meteorites, and none of them have been meteorites. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it's actually hard to tell. Meteorites are usually at least somewhat magnetic, so that helps. And uh, if you find something that's slightly magnetic and has tiny flecks of metal, and if you cut into it and has lots of little spheres inside, then you might have a meteorite. In which case, you should probably go to a local university and ask a geology person. <laughs> Wait, you, you said if you cut into it. How do you mm -hmm. cut into a rock? Oh, um, the, uh, the easiest way, uh, go to a hardware store or a, what, a Home Depot or something like that and get a tile saw. It's a saw that like will cut through like well tiles, but it usually can be used to cut rocks as well. So if I have like a meteorite I want or a potential meteorite I want to take a look inside, I'll use a tile saw and saw through it. And I, you would wear your protective eyewear. Yeah, this is one of those like <laughs> don't do it at home unless you do the research and have protection. Yeah, right. wear eyewear, wear gloves, and be careful. <laughs> and what other tools should a... Uh, I, le I actually learned this word, a rock hound. Mm -hmm. So a rock hound is somebody who goes out and collects rocks, right? Yep. Okay, so what other tools should a, a beginner rock hound have? Uh, you should have what's called a loop. And technical term, it's a jeweler's loop, uh, spelled L-O-U-P-E. And it's basically a uh, portable magnifying glass that has pretty high power. You put it up to your eye, and that way you can take a closer look at whatever you're finding. Uh, other tools you should probably have on hand. It's always good to have magnets. Always good to have like something to carry your rocks in. Always good to have like water if you're going out. And always wear a hat because sun. <laughs> and uh, yeah, the loop is the best tool I found. Although recently I've also liked the uh, uh, a macro lens for a smartphone. You could get these on Amazon and they just clip onto your smartphone and you could take gorgeous, really high magnification pictures using it. Yeah, and uh, some of my, my Twitch uh, audience, I have a Twitch audience with a t um, my science account, the t A Tiny World, um, but some of them are, are really, really into this stuff. And mm -hmm. someone mentioned that I should get myself a black light. Is that helpful? A black light's good if you're into uh, rocks that glow. <laughs> so there's certain types of rocks that will, uh, if you put a UV or ultraviolet light on it, it will fluoresce. So like certain minerals like calcite will like fluoresce red or willamite will fluoresce green. And it's not a property of all rocks, but it's interesting if that's something you're into. Okay, that's good to know too. Mm -hmm. um, you have a Patreon. You give out a Mineral of the Month. Is that something that you're still doing? Yes, we have a Mineral of the Month club up on Patreon. And uh, if you join us, basically every month I send you an interesting mineral and all the, uh, a lot of like, uh, I make my, I make create a information card that goes with it. So about the history of this type of specimen and what its chemical makeup is and various facts. And just a caveat on that, that's only available for Americans, right? It's available for Americans unless you, if you're international, you have to like subscribe for at least three or four months. That way the shipping costs build up and then I can send it out. So if you subscribe for four months and you're in Canada, then I'll ship it to you. Oh, very cool. I did not know that. Yep. <laughs> Um, you quickly mentioned the Rocked app. Are there mm -hmm. any other apps or technological tools that um, that you would use in your day to day life or whenever you need to identify something? Not really. <laughs> I mean, if I have like an interesting potential meteorite, for example, say I go to a rock show or a mineral show, and I find a cool looking thing that's uh, potentially an interesting meteorite. I will like cut off a piece and send it to uh, one of my friends, or you could send it to a lab that has a X-ray spectrometer. And the spectrometer will analyze its chemicals, and based on that, it'll tell you if it's a meteorite or even if it's a rare type of meteorite. So that's uh, one of the more advanced tools. But aside from that, uh, most of my stuff, it's fairly basic. Basic as in you, ha you already have the knowledge. Yep. It's like there's... A lot of 
uh, at a certain point in rock collecting, you sort of like can just identify a rock based on uh, based on sight. So <laughs> it's really not okay. much of a diagnostic tool. So aside from rocks, fossils, minerals, all that stuff, I want to know a little bit more about you. Mm -hmm. um, what other th interests do you have? What other things are you into? Huh, that's a good question. So let's see, we covered the rocks. Oh, I'm cur I am into a little bit of a gardening. I grow some carnivorous plants uh, because I'm, I like carnivorous plants. They're cool. Um, yeah, uh, I've been, gar uh, since due to COVID, I've been like doing a lot of backyard gardening and currently squash are taking over my garden. So, <laughs> so um, carnivorous plants, what got you into that? Uh, it's just something that's always fascinated me since I was a kid. It's like Venus flytraps, sundews, pitcher plants, and all that. And uh, one of my biggest ones is this uh, pitcher plant that like has foot-long pitchers. It's a tropical pitcher plant called uh, Nepenthes. And I like rescued it from Home Depot years ago. And now it's gotten like gigantic and it's got like six-foot vines. <laughs> huh. So you're essentially growing a little shop of horrors. Yes, I am. <laughs> uh, so you um, you did your education at Princeton. Mm -hmm. um, did you did you go to grad school? I am currently in grad school. Actually, it's like I'm at the Johns Hopkins University uh, program in geospatial intelligence. Uh, this is because uh, geospatial intelligence is basically using maps and aerial images to figure out things, and since I've always been playing around with various maps. It's I decide it's something that's useful. And probably after this, I'm going to go into grad school for geology or paleontology or something like that. That's really cool. And what um, what was the reason that you didn't go straight to grad school right after? Did you just decide to take a break or? Yeah, I decided to take a break. And then it's like, basically, I was doing fun stuff and <laughs> I didn't want to have to like go to grad school and like take further classes when a lot of what I already know is like already or, or a lot of what I learned doing geology stuff already like became the equivalent which is this is also why I decided not to get a master's in paleontology it's like if I already have a lot of those skills why should I pay money to get those skills again <laughs> exactly so, yeah yeah, I talk to a you know a wide variety of scientists. I myself mm -hmm. uh, am a seven-time university dropout, so <laughs> I'm always curious to see how people's paths you know um, mm -hmm. took place for education. Uh, did you ever have any pressure in your family growing up as to you know you should be a, a, a an artist or a doctor or whatever, or did you were you really allowed to choose your own path? Um, I was allowed to choose my own path, although there was a lot of pressure to do really well in uh, for academics. So I was like fairly high up in my class. I had pretty high SAT scores and I was very involved in very student groups and things, which is uh, how I eventually got into Princeton. So that was about the main pressure as for what I majored in and what my interests were. Uh, my parents in encouraged an interest in rocks just because it's one of the sciences. So uh, aside from that, uh, oh, uh, they, I was basically allowed to like direct my own path. That's really neat. Uh, did you ever have uh, any doubts or did you ever think, oh, maybe I want to actually study plants, not rocks? Hmm. I don't think I had any doubts because like the geology programs are if you're into rocks they're a lot of fun because you get to go on field trips everywhere so uh, we went on field trips to new mexico montana vermont and uh yeah saw a lot of rocks in the field and it was a really fun major and what was your experience like at, at princeton it was pretty good i enjoyed it uh, i was in the marching band played trombone and ah. they had the Princeton has a weird system. They have what's called eating clubs. These are clubs where you go to eat and hang out and stuff once you turn once you become a junior. And they're the equivalent of like a fraternity or sorority, except they're co-ed. So they have like parties every weekend, stuff like that. And that's like your little social dynamic. And so I enjoyed that. And of course the food was great. And uh yeah, I had I enjoyed my experience at Princeton. Do you still play the trombone? Uh, rarely. <laughs> oh, that's too bad. Do you miss? Do you miss playing music? 
Uh, yeah, and I do actually miss playing music, and I hopefully will get back into it eventually. Okay. What kind of music do you listen to yourself? Uh, 90s rock alternative. <laughs> like? Oh, uh, let's see. There's a... <sighs> like, um, are we thinking like Nirvana kind of alternative? Yes, a little bit of Nirvana. More like a lot of like, uh, what's the word? Um, Oasis and Fastball, uh, Weezer. And then I guess I went through a uh, ska punk phase and uh, me first into Gimme Gimme's. Uh, various like covered bands like that, Our Lady Peace. I think th that area of like, yeah, <laughs> rock alternative. Cool. That's actually the kind of music I listen to when I am. I, I'm 43 years old and I got myself a BMX bike oh, uh, nice. a year ago. <laughs> so when I go out on my, my BMX bike, I pop in the, you know, the 90s rock tunes. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just curious too, like when you meet new people, what do you tell them you do? Oh, that's uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, currently, I tell them I'm a geologist. Well, it depends on the situation. I'll go with either I'm a geologist or I'm a grad student or I'm a writer. <laughs> it, it varies, but I've certainly used any of those. And so you said, uh, you know, you went back to the writing thing. Mm -hmm. uh, are you working on another book? Yeah. So uh, let's see. This fall, my second book, 50 State Gems and Minerals, will come out. And currently, I am working on a third book, which I'm still laying the groundworks for, but uh, it will be related to that. Is that is that something that you envision yourself doing in the future? Do you want to actually do more book writing? Do you want to teach? Do you want to just uh, keep you know nerding out on rocks and fossils? Oh, that's another good question. Um, well, I like writing. It's but there's very little like payoff from writing. It's you don't really make unless you write say a new york times bestseller you don't really make money from that um so um i'm probably gonna write a few more of these like nonfiction guidebook things and then i have a plan for a few books about like various uh other sciencey topics that would be like more adult in nature rather than kids books and um We'll see how that goes. But aside from that, uh, eventually, I'm not sure what I want to do. <laughs> okay, so you're just going to kind of go with the flow, I guess. Uh, go with the flow. I would love to get into some more consulting work, museum consulting or geology-related consulting. And uh, yeah, go with the flow. Hold on. What do you do when you're a museum consultant? Uh, there are several museum projects I work on where a museum is looking for a specific display and I help provide them with one input and two resources where, because I know a lot of people in the fossil mineral and meteorite industries. So if they're like, oh, we want this sort of display with this sort of meteorite, I'll be like, okay, I know who you should talk to and I can help you reach out to them and also help them get a specimen for a good cost. Okay, that's fun. Very cool. And uh, so you plan on, you said that you plan on writing a little bit more for adults. Mm -hmm. uh, what would be like a topic that you'd like to, to write, uh, you know, for adult um, nonfiction? Uh, let's see, there's, um, there's a few, like, uh, there's a few bio, like, sort of biographies I would like to like, write about, about some like, interesting people I've met along the way. Uh, for example, um, one of my professors, Gerda Keller, she has a, a crazy like life story. It's like in the paleological paleontological ru, uh, realm, Dr. Gerda Keller is known for being a proponent that, well, okay, let's go back to the beginning here. Um, uh, you know, the uh, extinction of the dinosaurs, the big asteroid hits the earth and all that. Right. So there's that. But she had the theory that the Deccan Traps, which were these massive volcanoes in India, contributed to their extinction before the asteroid came and like wiped them out. So her theory is very controversial. And so she's gotten a lot of flack for that. And also because she was a woman in academia for like the past three decades. So she's had a lot of interesting battles and she's also had a lot of interesting life stories like... Uh, 
she was shot during a bank robbery in Australia and <laughs> stuff like that. <laughs> so it's like uh, the stories we she told us during her classes were like amazing and she definitely needs a book about her. So there's like uh, various characters like that who I would love to write longer nonfiction about. And her name was Dr. Keller? Yes, Dr. Goethe Keller. Goethe. Yep. And was she at Princeton? Yes. Oh, man. Is she, t- is she still teaching there? Uh, I believe she is. Yeah, she's still at least publishing articles. Amazing. You have to. I implore you to write a book on her. Uh, I'll send you uh, an article about her later. She is fascinating. Please. <laughs> please. I'd love to ha- even have you back on the show just to <laughs> to promote that book because that does sound like a very fascinating <laughs> life story. And I'm actually I'm I'm thrilled that you've taken interest in her story. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, listen, Yanan, um, we're pretty much done for for today. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the things I wanted to know was what... Uh, websites do you recommend uh, for people who are interested first of all the websites interested um, in you and and your work but also other websites that they might um, might be useful for beginners uh, let's see um, for me and my work I'm still working on like properly doing a website so I don't have anything specific right now but they can follow me on Twitter at at fossil locator and that's the easiest way both to like see what I'm up to and uh, get in touch with me. Uh, resources. There's a win- uh, website called Mindat, M-I-N-D-A-T dot org. Now, Mindat is basically, it's a catalog of all the, um, all the minerals in the world. So if they have something like, for example, Opal, and they want to know, is it an official mineral? What's it made of? What's, where is it found? They could just enter it in there and they could find it. Or they could, like, say, enter a location, say, uh, South Dakota, and see what minerals are found in South Dakota and where are they found. And you could probably, it's for everywhere around the world. You could also, like, look up where you are, for example, and see where are the mines or mineral locations around me and what has been found there. So it's a very useful resource. Yeah, that is very, very useful. So uh, listen, Yanan, mm-hmm. thank you so much for saying yes, for doing this uh, this interview with me, for making the kid in me absolutely thrilled that she got all the answers to her questions. So I really appreciate your time and uh, the fact that you were, re- you were willing to uh, share your knowledge with us. All right. No problem. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Thank you.